The enemy in war is always real, and this film, The Silent Enemy, deals with a special enemy force that must be silenced once and for all. Let's dive into The Silent Enemy from 1958, one of the best. Hi, this is Tom Pizzotto. And Dan Silvestri. Of SpyMovieNavigator.com. Join us for each episode of our podcast show, Cracking the Code of Spy Movies. Please subscribe to our show, give us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast app, and tell your friends about the show, too. That helps us get more listeners and do more shows. Thanks. Now, before we get started into the movie, Malta plays a part in the unfolding of the story here in The Silent Enemy. Now, I've been to Malta and to the underground war rooms in Valletta, where Eisenhower, Cunningham, and Montgomery met and planned the 1943 invasion of Sicily. Malta was a strategic island in World War II because it sits between Italy and the northern coast of Africa, so this was a key island to hold. The war rooms are now a museum, and it is exactly the way it was during the war, with floor-to-ceiling maps of the area, air defense war rooms, the bridge with the commander's office overlooking a map of the sea with ship deployments and so on. It's fascinating. If you have a chance to travel in that area, be sure to head to Malta. It's about 65 miles south of Sicily by ferry boat. Great. So, Dan, with the war room that you're talking about here, how close to that is some of the things you see in some of the sets in some of the James Bond movies where, you know, they've got the big map on the wall and all of that? It literally is exactly how it was in World War II. And there is a, a, a movie called The Malta Story, and it's basically exactly like The Malta Story. And in some of the Bond films and so on, you're going you're gonna to see some of these kinds of things where the maps are there and so on. And it's all certainly a reference to what the real stuff looked like. This bunker kind of war room thing in Valletta, Malta, was probably somewhere between 100 and 200 feet below ground. So it's, it really is amazing to see this and to see, again, where they were planning the invasion of Sicily. And we'll see later on as we're talking about this movie, The Silent Enemy, how important this particular thing was with the, with the planning of the invasion of Sicily because Sicily was put out there as a ruse as to why the Allies were going to invade in Greece and Sardinia and not Sicily, and that was put out there as a ruse to throw off the enemy. So pretty cool stuff. That is, That does sound pretty cool. Yeah. I'd love to go down 200 feet down into a bunker like that. That's cool. Yeah, and the cool thing there was when, when they were digging it, they didn't want the Germans who were on Sicily, only 65 miles away, to know that they were digging this bunker. And so as the Germans were bombing Valletta, which they did round, round basically 24 hours a day, they would mix the debris of the digging the tunnels up with the debris on the on the surface so the Germans <laughs> never knew what was going on, that they were digging this tunnel thing. And so, so the whole story is fascinating. So deception is important. Yes. Which yes. this brings us back into yeah. the 1958 movie, The Silent Enemy. Yes. Now, now, we should also state before we dive into this, we are talking about the 1958 The Silent Enemy, not the 1930 movie The Silent Enemy, which was about Native Americans. Correct. Right. So just uh, when you look, if you look up The Silent Enemy, there are two different movies with the same name. We're talking about the one from 1958. Yeah. So The Silent Enemy here that we're talking about, it's a World War II movie set in the Mediterranean in 1941, and it's about British ships in Alexandria and Gibraltar being mysteriously blown up. The ships are both warships, like British battleships, and merchant ships that will transport needed supplies to Malta, the strategic island we just talked about in World War II between Sicily and northern, the northern coast of Africa. Yeah, now they also mentioned something called Algeciras, which is actually one of the largest ports in the world. Mm -hmm. It is on the Bay of Gibraltar, and what I really like is in this movie which we're going to talk a little bit about in a minute, isn't a documentary but has a lot of historical fact in it. Yeah. They do get these facts right. Yeah. There's a lot of facts in this movie. Some of it is exaggerated and interpreted and a poetic license to, to change some things. But a lot of the stuff is based on real facts, like Lieutenant Lionel Crabb. He's an explosion expert. And he's brought in to figure out what's going on here. And the rest of the film details his exploits. 
the team that he assembles and the skills he has at defusing bombs and at becoming an underwater diving expert. So it's interesting to note, like we said, some of the stuff is real. Lionel Crab, also known as Buster Crab, is a real person. He was active in World War II and beyond. And there are some interesting connections between this film and some James Bond films. The Silent Enemy, based on the book Commander Crab by Marshall Pugh, contains historical facts, but again, like Tom said, it's not a documentary. The details depicted are not necessarily accurate as they unfold in the film, but Crab was real, and we will share an interesting real-life story involving his disappearance. Now, Dan, this is the same Lionel Crab that we referred to him in our podcast, How Events in the Real World Affect What Goes Into Spy Films, Part 1. And we talk about some of his historical happenings and how he really was a real person and how he actually made a pretty big influence on how things worked in World War II. Yeah, so check that podcast out as well. So back to The Silent Enemy. The acting here, I think, is really solid. The cast, led by Lawrence Harvey as Lionel Crabb, Don Adams as the third officer, Jill Masters, John I Clemens. Think she's she's phenomenal because yeah, she, she's, she's got this just great, I'm in charge, but I'm not really in charge attitude. That's great demeanor. Really she fun. Is. Yeah, yeah, she's great. John Clements, he's the admiral. He's great. And Sidney James, I love Sidney James in this oh, movie. Phenomenal. The chief petty officer, <laughs> Thorpe. He is fabulous in this movie. You could not have selected a better person, and you could not have asked him to act any better than this. He is so believable a character here. And Michael Craig as Seaman Knowles he is also excellent. The director, William Fairchild, does a spectacular job, as does the underwater camera expert, Egil Waxholt, which is not so easy to say. And the director of photography, Otto Heller. Now, Otto Heller, he did some great films, including the 1965 spy movie, The Ipcris File, with Michael Caine. So, there you go. Yeah, I was actually surprised that Egil was not used in the TV series Sea Hunt, because a lot of these guys who did this underwater camera work... It was a specialty. Yeah, ended up on that TV series, and then a bunch of them ended up moving into the Bond series. Yeah. The opening scene is immediately intriguing and draws you into the film. I love this film. I think it's terrific. It is nighttime, and you see some ty- some kind of activity in the ocean. There are frogmen on some type of powered watercraft on the surface. Then they dive with the watercraft below the surface, all in the dark of night, apparently heading for the harbor at Alexandria. Underwater, we see the frogmen on this craft. It looks like a two-seater device with one seat behind the front seat. And it's being propelled forward. And we see each of these crafts is carrying an explosive warhead with a propeller at its rear. It almost looks like a torpedo. Now, you mentioned the opening scene here, Dan. Actually, the title sequence, when they start with that, they've got this close-up of a dark, murky water at night. Yeah. And it's it's really dark with a with a light above it and probably you know presumably the moon right, and it's all rough and you're looking at it and there's an ominous feel to it before you then get into seeing the actual frogmen yeah, and do, the human torpedoes. Yeah, they do create a a mystery and intrigue immediately with with those scenes that you're talking about, and that is during the title sequence, which is pretty cool. We see them approaching the hull of this ship. And they affix these lines to the hole and put an explosive device just below the the hole line of the ship. It's suspended by cords or wires. We see these two British battleships on the surface, the HMS Queen Elizabeth and the HMS Valiant. After the frogmen complete their task, they retreat using these, these underwater craft again, they, and they get to some kind of a ship. And at daybreak, these two ships, the Queen Elizabeth and the Valiant, explode and are heavily damaged. Yeah. And now we're discovering something about these frogmen. We discover that they're part of this Italian brigade and that the underwater crafts that they were using here were called chariots. And these chariots were altering the balance of power in the Mediterranean. Now, Dan... As we talk about these chariots and we talk about Lionel Crab, we're talking about the fact that these are real facts that happened, although this isn't truly a documentary. 
Right. In real life, the Queen Elizabeth and Valiant were severely damaged by these Italian teams using these human torpedoes or chariots yes. as a way they got to the to the ship and to plant these explosives. They also mention a, a ship called the Willowdale. And this was interesting to me because trying to find any information about that, that ship was tough. I, although I did find one entry on this one website saying that yeah. the Willowdale was moved from Cadiz, Spain to Gibraltar in November of 1942. So this movie was supposed to be 1941. Yeah, it opens up December 19th, 1941, the, the ships blowing up in Alexandria. Right. Yeah, so this doesn't. Yeah. This one actually is one point where it's almost like, because they imply that the Willowdale was one of the ships that then blows up in, a little bit later. They never expl- expressly state that, but it's kind of implied. But here I'm finding that this ship actually did exist in November of 42. Okay. We're going to look at several connections between the events of The Silent Enemy and the film itself to other spy movies, particularly James Bond movies. Yeah, I think there might be a connection to James yeah. Bond in here. Okay, Bond fans. This movie is 1958, based on real events that took place in December 1941. Ian Fleming published his ninth book, Thunderball, in March of 1961, three years after the film The Silent Enemy and 20 years after the real event. And the Ian Productions film Thunderball was released in December 1965. Ha! The British developed such a chariot that we're talking about here in real life in 1942. So over a year after the events of this film, But the Italians, they were the pioneers of this technology and the means of warfare and sabotage at least a year ahead of the British. And certainly Ian Fleming knew about this. And that's pretty much guaranteed because in his novel Thunderball, 1961, Fleming mentions the chariots several times. And in one particular instance, you can check this out, look on page 101, he writes... A tiny worm of underwater light was creeping out towards the jolly boat. It was a two-man underwater chariot, identical with those used by the Italians during the war, and brought with improvements from Ansaldo, the firm that had originally invented the one-man submarine. It was towing an underwater sled used for recovery and transport of heavy objects under the sea. Okay. Hey, Dan, let me stop you right there. So you and I could talk about the chariots and their influence on Ian Fleming and Thunderball. In fact, we were actually prepared to do that here today. We are. Yeah, but when you were doing your research, you came across this article on jamesbondmemes.blogspot.com that actually talks about this influence. So you reached out to the author of the site, Edward Bedolf, and got his comments on the influence of these chariots on Ian Fleming. Yeah, it, it, was a, it was a cool article he had written, and I thought, okay, let's ask if he could give us a couple of comments on it. So let's go ahead and let's hear his thoughts as we bring back the segment that we call The Smartest Spy in the Room. All right, Edward, you're the smartest spy in the room. Let's go. My name is Edward Bidolf, and I'm an independent researcher of all aspects of Ian Fleming and James Bond, and I'm the author of two blogs, James Bond Memes and James Bond Food. When he came to write the James Bond books, Ian Fleming often harked back to the Second World War, drawing on his, his own experiences and those of the agents and commandos he met in the course of his duties. One case in point is Thunderball. In Chapter 10, Fleming tells us that Spectre used a two-man underwater chariot identical with those used by the Italians during the war, to tow a sled to transport the captured atomic weapons from the submerged Vindicator aircraft. Later in Chapter 23, as he leads a unit of US submariners uh, submariners, in an underwater battle against Spectre's frogmen, James Bond encounters villain Emilio Largo sitting astride the chariot. We don't know whether Largo himself served as an Italian frogman during the war, but he certainly seemed comfortable on the machine. And it's no wonder. The Italians were the pioneers of the chariot when engaging in underwater sabotage, and it it was only when Italian charioteers, as they were known, successfully attacked 
British ships in the Mediterranean in 1941 that Britain first became aware of this special means of warfare. The Italian chariot, also known as the Human Torpedo, was a 22-foot-long cigar-shaped craft that incorporated a detachable warhead containing 500 pounds of explosives. Two men sat astride the chariot and, by means of a battery-powered propeller and compressed air tank to regulate depth, they moved slowly towards the target ship. Once there, the frogmen fixed lines across the ship's hull, tied the warhead to the lines, released the warhead and made their escape. Realising the threat from the Italians, and not without a little grudging admiration, British naval chiefs turned to their technical divisions in early 1942 to create a similar craft and a range of other equipment, including rubber wetsuits and breathing apparatus. The British managed to acquire Italian machines, and Buster Crab uh, was one of the famous early testers of these uh, weapons. Buster Crab, of course, mysteriously died in in uh, in circumstances while trying to um, uh, while investigating a, a, a Soviet ship later on. However, the British knew that if they were to stand any chance of the maritime threat and also conduct their own underwater operations, especially in colder waters, they needed to research and develop practically from scratch their own capability. By summer 1942, the British-built two-man chariot known as a jeep was ready for operations, along with other machines such as X-Craft or a four-man midget submarine and a single-seater underwater craft. At this time, a call went out for volunteers for special service, who, after a period of intensive training, began their work. This also included setting mines. Thunderball gives us a little insight into the secret underwater world. It also gives us an insight into Ian Fleming's own mind. He was fascinated by the sea. There is plenty of underwater action in in, in Live and Let Die, for instance, and in the novel, uh, Ian Fleming alluded to another aspect of the frogman's work, planting limpet mines. And of course, James Bond himself uh, himself uh, plants a limpet mine uh, on Mr. Big's ship. In 1953, Ian Fleming visited Jacques Cousteau's underwater excavation of an ancient Roman wreck in the Mediterranean, off the coast of Marseille, and wrote about it for the Sunday Times. He even dived with Cousteau, but being a heavy smoker and drinker, he was unable to reach the wreck before being forced to resurface. Still, he made up for it at his winter home at Goldeneye in Jamaica, where he swam it in the sea every day and became something of an expert on the local marine life. Most intriguingly, in 1941, he told Maud Russell, a colleague of his at Naval Intelligence, that he was considering resigning from his intelligence duties and joining a motor torpedo boat, uh, motor torpedo boat crew where he would see more action. Of course, the idea may never have been a serious one, but it does reveal an, er- an early interest with underwater action that would be expressed in his later novels. All right, thanks, Edward. That's great stuff. You can find Edward Bidolf at jamesbondmemes.blogspot.com and at jamesbondfood.com. And you could also find Edward on Twitter at at bondmemes. So thanks a lot, Eddie. One a little addition to this story, Edward kind of mentioned Largo in his talk as well. Now, in real life, and this is true, part of the coup of the sinking of the two British ships in Alexandria included this guy called Emilio Bianchi. And it is believed that Emilio Bianchi inspired the character Emilio Largo in Thunderball. So that's pretty cool. All right. So if you want to find out more about these chariots or the human torpedoes, go to YouTube and search for Italian SLC Human Torpedo of World War II. That's S is in Sierra, L is in Lima, and C is in Charlie. Italian SLC Human Torpedo of WW2. There are some really good videos up there, and they actually let you see what these things look like. And what they look like is what they look like in the film as well. So it's it's kind of cool. cool. They really did a good job of of using the the actual stuff when they could. Yeah. Now that's the chariots in the Silent Enemy. Let's fast forward to Thunderball for us Bond fans. And the underwater sleds and chariots that they used there were actually inspired by these chariots from the silent enemy. But we have to also remember the timing of things. Three years before Fleming wrote Thunderball, this movie, The Silent Enemy, came out. Mm -hmm. 
And remember, you know, underwater crafts and stuff change all the time. And the crafts that they use in Silent Enemy were actually from the 1940s. And they've changed. They've updated them over time. And so the the sleds and stuff that we see in Thunderball are definitely updated yeah. from what we have in the movie The Silent Enemy. But certainly based on The Silent Enemy and World War II stuff. So Tom and I, when we were at in London at the Bond in Motion Museum, saw a couple of these underwater sleds that they have in the in the museum. Fascinating stuff. You got to get there sometime. There's also a great book that Edward mentions in his article called The Frogmen, The Story of the Wartime Underwater Operations. And it's by T.J. Waldron and James Gleason. The Italian frogman's next target is Gibraltar, the gateway to the Mediterranean, and key supply routes to North Africa and Malta. The British generals know that across the bay in Spain, Someone is watching or spying on all of the moves that the British are making. When the ships come in, when they dock for the night, etc. So there's a spy in Spain informing the subs when the convoys are going to arrive. Yeah, and you got to remember, Spain was neutral in World War II. So this is kind of an intriguing little part of the film, but an intriguing part of real life too. Yeah, and I love how they're, they're doing, they're showing these spies with, these big telescopes looking across the bay because right. it's not that far yeah. and trying to understand exactly what's going on. Since British and potentially merchant or cargo ships are being blown up, the British call in this explosive expert, Lieutenant Lionel Philip Kenneth Crabb. He makes his way into the Admiral's office in Gibraltar, but he can't get an appointment. Yeah, that was kind so of he, funny. <laughs> yeah, and he's you know he's trying to do this <laughs> interaction with in. <laughs> you. You've got to get permission from Jill Masters to see the Admiral, and there's a bunch of humor around just that little bit there. But he can't get in, so he heads down to the docks. There he finds these two divers, yeah. which actually is the whole force yeah. the British have to stop the carnage. It's only two people. Yeah. Crab knows two divers won't cut it, so he decides on the spot to have a dive with them, even though eh, he's he really not a wasn't diver. a diver. He's an explosive expert. <laughs> he's a, yeah, he's just. Ah, I'm going to become a diver now. Yeah. He he does this really well and impresses the other divers, and then the admiral shows up, and he sees what's happening and tells Crab, "You're on the diving team." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Crab does his practicing with the ships. He's examining the holes for explosives. We know because we've seen it that the bombs that were attached to the Queen Elizabeth. And the Valiant were torpedo-shaped. They had a propeller, and they were attached to the hull of the ship via clamps and cables. So again, this is reality showing up in the movie here. Mm -hmm. So Crab heads out on a night mission to a ship to see if it has any bombs attached to it. So Crab is about to dive to examine the ship when the captain says to him, it might be booby-trapped, to which Crab says, <laughs> we're kind of very Bond-like here. Yeah. You'll know it as soon as I do. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this <laughs> guy this guy line. is calm, but I guess you would have to be if you're an explosive <laughs> expert. <laughs> you better it's be. Booby, if it's booby trap, yep. you'll know it as soon as I do. Yeah. That's great. Well, there is a bomb attached, and Crab and another diver loosen it. You can hear ticking, mm -hmm. and they drag this tethered bomb ashore. Now, remember, Crab is an explosives expert, and that's going to be important right here. Yeah, he, he's, again, very calm and cool. He's on this airstrip, and he's about to remove the clock and detonator device. There are three detonators and two 48-hour clocks in this device, and Crab pulls out gingerly the detonators, exactly like James Bond does in Octopussy, written in 1962, the movie in 1983. It's almost an exact copy of the way that he does the removal of the de the detonator in Octopussy. Yeah. I mean, there's other movies where there are bombs and so on in Bond movies, like Goldfinger, of course, Bond fails to defuse the bomb there. In The World is Not Enough, Bond kind of defuses the bomb when he has the plutonium rod eject forcefully at the last second, killing Renard, if you remember that gold rod. So that's kind of diffusion but not exactly like this. The crab incident in The Silent Enemy and Octopussy, that's pretty identical. And you see in The Spy Who Loved Me, Bond 
reprograms the bombs so the subs blow each other up and stuff like that. But Octopussy and the Silent Enemy, exact. Yeah, no but in, in the in the Spy Who Loved Me though, Dan, if we, we remember that scene, mm-hmm. they're on the Lipperus, and he's there with Captain Carter, who's, who's the guy played by uh, Shane Rimmer. Yeah, Shane was right? great. And so before they reprogrammed the bombs, they had to remove the detonator, and there was that that magnetic pole in the detonator that. Oh, that's true. Could, that's true. Right. So it's it's it is very very similar with the addition of this magnetic pole thing that to the scene that of crab trying to pull that detonator out of the bomb. Yeah. And I would imagine that if this is the way you have to really defuse bombs, then okay, that makes sense. But anyway, you see it here, 1958 crab doing it and you're going to see it in bond films as well. So in this particular film, crab discovers that these bombs would explode one of two ways at a set time due to the clock timers or and this is clever if the ship started moving before the timers were set to blow after so many revolutions of the propellers remember we said propellers were attached to these bombs after so many revolutions of the propellers that were attached to these bombs the bombs would blow most likely out at sea so it looked like maybe the ship got torpedoed this is clever so oh, absolutely because you they're really trying to hide the fact that they've got these frogmen down there yes. attaching these bombs. Yeah. So if they can do it where it looks like yeah that thing just got torpedoed at sea. Yeah. What a brilliant way to kind of mask that. Yeah, and in the beginning you you, you did hear them say that there was no subactivity around. So how the heck are they blowing up the ships in Alexandria? So that's true Tom that they they were, they were really were looking first for for subs. And so this would be another smokescreen basically to say hey yeah, these might be subs blowing these things up and not the frogmen so you have all of this going on and the british and crab have a lot a lot of work to do there's they report no subactivity so they're they're baffled with all these things blowing up it's like how are these things going up if there's no subs around yeah. or how are we missing the subs again they know that there's, there's this spy network in spain again a neutral country in world war ii and they're spying on them, like you said, with telescopes and binoculars so they could see the ship movements and so on. The Italian team has been at this villa in Spain, specifically in Algeciras, for about 10 months. So they're led by this guy, Antonio Tamolino, one of the Italian experts at underwater warfare. And this is in Cadiz, Spain, where you know parts of Die Another Day were filmed, the Cuba scenes, as you recall. So, yeah, now, again, they're using these large binoculars or telescopes to see what's happening across the bay, which actually got me thinking about where are telescopes used in other spy movies. Mm-hmm. And I was actually, so I, I did some research on looking into all of the James Bond movies, all of the Mission Impossibles, and all of the Jason Bourne movies. Okay. So, you know, <laughs> it's what, what can I say? So I was trying to find these things. Uh-huh. Now, I did discount gun scopes okay. being used. Good. So if you think about it on Her Majesty's, when he looks through the gun scope, mm-hmm. uh, when they're at the beach, right. or when Jason Bourne in Bourne Identity right. is using the gun scope kind of as a, almost like a telescope kind of a thing. Mm-hmm. So in James Bond, we see Bond using a telescope to see the Goldfingers cheating at cards in Goldfinger. Mm-hmm. Also... Bond checks out the flying saucer in Never Say Never Again, which is the remake of Thunderball, if you will. That's where he sees Domino dancing on the deck. Right, the flying so, saucer. So as there's opposed two to the in the disco volante. Yeah. I'm sorry? As opposed to the disco volante. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Flying which saucer, is Italian they call it in <laughs> Flying <laughs> saucer. Again. Yeah, okay. So you have in, in Sean Connery Bonds, there's those two. In Moonraker, Roger Moore's Bond is on the observation deck, and he turns and he's looking at looking at Holly Goodhead, who's looking at him through a telescope. Mm-hmm. And then finally, in the Bourne Ultimatum, Jason Bourne has this small handheld telescope that he uses when he calls Pam, and, and that's really it. I was really surprised I couldn't find more telescope use in spy movies. Yeah. So chances are, then I've missed some, or there are other spy movies that have had telescopes in there. So if we have, please leave us a comment on spymovienavigator.com and let us know where we missed one. Yeah, that's good. So back to the movie, you have a situation here that is baffling to Crab and the crew. 
They don't know what's going on. Crab is kind of stumped. He, he's thinking that they've got to be using frogmen and not some kind of uh, uh, watercraft because he's thinking if they used watercraft like chariots or whatever, they would need a base and workshops for maintenance and all that kind of stuff. So he's thinking they can't be doing that. It's got to just be frogmen. So Crab is watching them through binoculars and they're watching the British through binoculars and telescopes as well, as you said. And at, at the villa where the Italians are in Algeciras, they become aware that British cruisers are coming into Gibraltar that evening, and they say their job is to sink them, of course. They have one chariot to use for this job, and the Italian frogmen are on the way. There's a sighting by the British that, of this chariot, and so a siren goes off, and hand-thrown depth charges are thrown overboard to try to sink this underwater craft. They get it to the surface, and one of the frogmen is killed, and eventually the British find the chariot. It could be useful later, but one of the frogmen gets killed, one of them gets away. So the British, being nice, provide a burial at sea for the dead Italian frogmen. Crab is now looking to recruit more divers because he knows they're going to need them. The cruisers are planning to leave for Malta. A chief petty officer, this guy named Thorpe, sees some of Crab's divers and he tries to give them some important tips because he had a history of this. Crab wants Thorpe to join the underwater working force, which is what they're going to be called. He does join and is now in charge of the divers for training and more, even though Crab is still the guy in charge of the operation. And Thorpe played brilliantly, like we said before, by Sidney James. He's a tough, believable character with this gentle side to him as well. So, Well, and it's so fun the way they do that, like the way they're doing the exercises and stuff. There's, I mean, it's serious. You've got to get in shape and everything. And the way he's doing it, there's almost a comedic element to it. Yeah. With the way he does it, but it's still doing the serious stuff. Yeah. And so, the, of course, the Italians across the bay are watching all this stuff. and They're laughing, thinking the British are diving for bombs that don't exist. Of course, they're practicing and so on. The Italians also spy merchant ships coming in to bring supplies to Malta, and that will be their target tonight. So they're not giving up. So that night, the Italians succeed in sinking three of these merchant ships, and Crab and the team remove limpet mines from many other ships to prevent them from blowing up. But fundamentally, they failed because three of these merchant ships got blown up. The history of Malta, and this is cool, and I learned this when I visited Malta, that it was such a critical island in the Mediterranean Sea, again, strategically located between Sicily, Italy, and the north coast of Africa. So it was very important to control Malta. And in reality, merchant ships, aircraft, and military transports were all targets in World War II to try to bring Malta to its knees and surrender. And in real life, Malta was days away in reality from doing that, from having to surrender because they, they were out of supplies, out of ammunitions, out of airplanes to defend Malta and so on. Very, very strategic island to control. So It's amazing how often they, you know, they were almost out of stuff yes. in the war when something happens. It was just kind of amazing. Yeah. So here in this film, they're blowing Actually, up these ships that needed to get to Malta. Yeah. You mentioned these three merchant ships coming in. One of those was the Willowdale that I referenced earlier. So they're going to blow up these merchant ships. But again, it doesn't. that one's the one that just doesn't feel, and we talk about the fact that they seem to get their facts right. That's the only one that really doesn't feel right for me. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, again, it's not a documentary, but it's, it's giving you the essence of what really happened in terms of undersea warfare that wasn't submarine warfare in World War II, and these things were strategic. So in the meantime, one of these British planes comes in and crashes in the bay. Yeah. And it's known that official and top secret papers were aboard that plane. So Crab and his divers must retrieve these papers before anyone else does or before they wash up onto the Spanish shore. Yeah. All right. This, is, this kind of reminds us of the real Operation Mincemeat in World War II, where the British intentionally washed up a body of what looked like to be a British general with many falsified documents that the British knew when washed up on the Spanish shore would be turned over to the Germans. In this briefcase, 
cuffed to the wrist of the dead person, who was really a tramp who died of rat poisoning, were all these fake documents about the invasion of Greece and Sardinia and that the invasion of Sicily was just a ruse. So this really happened in 1943. So the important thing is here in Silent Enemy, they're afraid that the real documents in this plane that just crashed would fall into enemy hands. In Operation Mincemeat, they intentionally wanted false documents to fall into the enemy hands. And all of this is important because of the importance of Malta. And again, in Malta, if you recall, Eisenhower and his staff were planning the invasion of Sicily. And so they wanted the enemy to think it was going to be Sardinia or Greece and not Sicily. So all of this is tied in together. It's pretty, okay, it's pretty cool. So, so then Crab and four of his divers are going to head down to where this plane crashed in, yes. find the plane, find the briefcase. Yeah. So here we have Frogmen. They're underwater looking for the wreckage of a plane, trying to retrieve something of immense value to the safety of the world. <laughs> yeah. Mm, we've, we've talked about that before. There's yeah. some great underwater shots of the divers, the sunken plane with the ocean water flowing through it, the divers inside the sunken plane. They're just some wonderful shots, especially since this was filmed in 1958. Yeah. I mean, this is the work of the underwater cameraman who you mentioned before, Egil Vauxhalt, and the shots are absolutely spectacular. They really are. These are fantastic shots, and it's 1958, as you said. Of course, us Bond fans are going to think of Thunderball again, and that's where we're going. Bond in Thunderball dives to the sunken plane to see if the nuclear weapons are still aboard. And Thunderball, noted for its fabulous underwater scenes, was preceded by The Silent Enemy seven years earlier. Diver Magazine in 2012 ranked Thunderball as one of the best scuba diving movies of all time. And in The Silent Enemy, Crab and his divers see enemy divers coming after the sunken plane in the briefcase. Mm. And a magnificent underwater fight ensues. The enemy in black wetsuits. Crab and his divers shirtless and in shorts. Now there's some great fight sequences inside the plane with the briefcase changing hand a num- hands a number of times, yeah, which cool. is kind of cool. And then at one point, one of Crab's guys sticks a knife through the face mask of one of the enemy divers, and another cuts the air hose of an enemy diver. Crab's guys still have the briefcase and recover it after some great underwater action shots. Both of these moves are duplicated in the fight in Thunderbolt. The harpoon through the mask, killing a guy, and multiple hoses getting cut. So again, in 1958, we're seeing these scenes, great underwater fight scenes with scuba divers. Great stuff. Yeah, and then you see you see them use those same themes in Thunderball, which is really neat. This isn't going to be the first time you see frogmen fighting underwater. There was a movie in 1951 called The Frogmen with Richard Woodmark and Dana Andrews. And there's some great underwater scenes in that film as well. And with midnight rendezvous with submarines and frogmen and all kinds of stuff. I mean, it's cool. It's not the first time you're seeing it here in Silent Enemy, but the underwater cinematography is pretty damn good here. Yeah, exactly. So the Italians have failed to recover the briefcase, and Crab's team was victorious. Yeah. Now the leader of the Italian brigade wants to target the ships from Algiers and Morocco carrying the British Army troops, and he's going to use the chariots and the warheads to do it. Crab wants to learn of the enemy's plans, but he's told he can't do anything in Spain because it's a neutral country, and this drives him nuts. He knows the convoy coming in needs protection, so he and another one of his men head to Algeciras with the help of Miguel, which is really some funny stuff with this this, this guy who has a boat. His name is Miguel, and it's It's pretty funny. They they bribe him with a bottle of scotch. Looks like Johnny Walker. It looks like Johnny Walker. Yeah. And he's going to bring Crab and, the, and his guy in the morning and get them out and back into Gibraltar in the evening. So he's going to take them out, let them do some reconnaissance, and then get them back by evening. Now, Crab has a history of being a maverick in real life and doing things he feels should be done and apologizing later. So he heads to Algeciras, pretending to be Swedes. They walk around this town market. And he heads to a cafe that Miguel had said to go, that everybody goes to. Yeah, they didn't know exactly what that meant, but they thought, okay, we'll go there. Yeah, we'll go there because everybody goes there. 
So they're listening for people speaking Italian to get a lead on the Italian squad doing the bombings. They finally hear some guys speaking Italian and follow them to this really this this large tanker ship. And there are these large oil drums that are going to get loaded aboard this ship. And they're like, is that an oil thing? And they, they you actually see the guy test the drum and there's oil in it, at least as far as we're concerned. Mm-hmm. So the Italians go aboard. And one of the drums, it's, it's hanging, and then it starts breaking loose while it's being hoisted onto the boat. And the look on every one of the Italians' faces as this thing starts you know, wobbling and is getting ready to fall yeah. is sheer panic. Yeah. Right? They're just like, oh, my gosh, this is going to hurt us when it comes down. So thinking this ship may be rigged with explosives, because that's what the Italians made it look like, they thought this was going to explode, he wants to check the hull of the tanker to see if there's bombs down there. Yeah. This was an Italian ship. I think it had an Italian name. I can't remember off the top of my head. But some, I'm, I was wondering why Crab and his, his buddy wanted to go check for explosives since it was an Italian ship and the Italians were the ones blowing up ships. They wouldn't blow up their own ship. But I was a little confused there as to why they were doing it. But then, okay, I understand. Okay, maybe they're just going to check the ship and see. Anyway, I don't know. I didn't. I was a little confused there. But the cool thing is, they do go underwater to check this ship, and they find yeah, they they get there. That's the important part. Yeah, they find an underwater hatch, and they find the chariots go through this hull in this hatch. No wonder they're thinking no one ever sees where they're coming from. Wait, wait. Does this remind us of anything else in a Bond film, particularly Thunderball? Ah, uh, Largo ship, the Disco <laughs> Volante <laughs> in Thunderwall has an underwater hatch and his sleds and chariots enter and leave uh, without detection from that hatch. Ah, you remember that? They swim up into the hatch, Crab and his cohort, and the holding area. And I have to say, when they, when they swim into this little holding area... It reminded me a little bit of Bond and Pam Bouvier swimming up into the wave crest, if you recall, in License to Kill. It's very much similar setting, very similar setting to that. Yeah, it definitely had a similar feel to it. And on a smaller scale, maybe, it reminded me of Stromberg's ship in The Spy Who Loved Me that could swallow up whole submarines. But this is the key thing. Aboard the ship in this holding area, they see a large room where there are bombs and chariots and equipment. So this is where they're maintaining these these things and where they're loading them up with bombs. So the drums of oil, in reality, didn't contain oil. They contained machinery and explosives to build warheads. So others from the ship start filing into the room, and Crab and his guy, they have to hide and they hide below in the water below the deck again. Yeah, I love that. It's like, okay, we're going to hide and uh, we're, we get into the water. There's a little bit of noise when they make water, but when they they make it into the water, but you don't they're, hear anything. They're absolutely silent. Well, there's a lot of people walking around, but the the grid that they're they're hiding under is is a grid. You could see through the grid. So if they would have looked down, they would have seen their two heads there. But they didn't look down. But again, this is Reminding me again of License to Kill with Bond and Pam in, in that little hold area hiding. And the Italians put a chariot in the water here with a propelled, propeller bomb. And Crab is thinking, it's like a giant factory carved out of the hull of a ship. Okay, this is like Stromberg's ship in The Spy Who Loved Me. Yeah, so that's the Lipperus. Yeah. And this Italian ship is actually called the Altera from Napoli. Okay. So, so, you know. Yeah, so that's pretty cool. That that absolutely is cool. And I love the little tie-ins we can see where it appears that when they made some of these Bond movies, they took some of the themes here from the way they filmed these in The Silent Enemy and tweaked them a little bit into the Bond movies. Yeah. Now, part of the convoy, we're get back to the theme here, right? So part of the convoy is going to arrive this evening, and there's going to be more tomorrow. Yeah, and and supply some supply ships, yeah. supply ships are going to come in. Yeah. So Crab gets back to Gibraltar and he read, he readies his captured chariot because they capture that chariot. Right. That one and again, thing. there's some great underwater shots of the Italians with their chariots cutting through the water trying to get to the ships. A ship blows up, then another, and more. And <laughs> Crab again, <laughs> I mean, they stopped 
something's happening, but here, more ships are getting blown up. Have they failed again? I, it looks like. Well, yeah, Crab, Crab actually is like, oh, we, we failed, and the, the Admiral's like, well, you actually, you know, saved X, I don't remember the number, but yeah. you saved a certain number of, of ships by doing what you're doing, and to me, that's a, that's a, yeah. that's success. Yeah. Okay. So the Italian team's going to have six chariots and warheads by the next night. So this 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 night they were going out with one. The next night they're going to have six chariots and warheads ready to go. Crab gets into the captured chariot and wants to blow up the Italian ship that they'd been aboard that had the factory and the chariots and the bombs on it. Yeah. Now, again, he has no <laughs> permissions to no. do this. No. <laughs> but he goes with another one of his team members. And the Italians plan to start their mission at 9 p.m. Yeah, so I, I think again, uh, again, this maverick guy is—he's going to go do this because <laughs> he thinks, okay, this ha- this ship's got to be blown up. This is the c- causing all of our problems. So I'm going to go do it, whether he has permission or not. So he, he's out. He's off doing this. So he sees the Italian ship out there, and he sets. He goes out with this with his chariot and his cohort he sets the warhead for a short delay they affix the bomb to the ship just before nine o'clock actually and i i don't know exactly why their chariot surfaces the italians spot it but then the bomb explodes beneath the ship and they swim away that's the end of boom the italian ship is gone all the chariots all the warheads everything else the fleet is safe we're okay so the end Now is... actually let me jump in here for a second because you're saying how everything's okay. But if we think back to uh, another thing that happened in the war with the Enigma machine where once we figured out how to decode it mm-hmm. we couldn't let the Germans know we knew how they were doing it. So by crab exploding this boat here he lets the Italians know we know how you've been doing this now. So just interesting from a, as as the war progresses and his plans happen, the fact that Crab went out on his own to do this may actually have ended up causing some problems. Nah, I don't think Solve their so. short-term problem. But nah. you know, if, you look at, if you look at the two different things, we know how you're doing this in this one case, and we don't want you to know we know. No, I mean, they, they would the have Enigma to, machine. Yeah, they'd have to change their tactics, the Italians or whatever. But now they know, hey, you, you can have a ship out there. We see a ship out there and we see bombings happening. We're going to go check out that ship. So I don't think so. I think it's okay. I think he, it's good that he did it. And I think it ended, well, of course, the British developed their own sleds uh, after this, Jeeps, they call them, chariots. And so I think it's fine. I think that this, this kind of ended the veiled threat. And now they knew. So if they saw a ship again, hey, we're going to be suspicious. I think we're good. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. So the, the ending here is kind of cool. Thorpe assembles the team, and they tell Crab that he's been awarded the George Medal, which actually happened in real life to yes, Lionel he was Crab. A, he was awarded the George Medal. So that wraps up our look at The Silent Enemy. We highly recommend this 1958 spy film. It's got great action. And it definitely appears to impact other spy movies. Yeah. I mean, then there's one other interesting thing about Crab. And this is, again, for real. And another connection to Thunderball, really. <laughs> if you could have one more connection to Thunderball. In 1956, a Soviet cruiser came to Britain. Now, we talk about this in the other real world podcasts that Tom was talking about earlier. But in 56... Yeah, How Real World Events and Other Movies Find Their Way Into Spy Movies, Part 1. Yeah. We have two two parts on that. You can check out Part 1 and 2. It's kind of fun how real world stuff gets into these movies. But anyway, in 1956, this Soviet cruiser was coming to Britain, and Nikita Khrushchev was on a state visit to Britain on this ship. He was the former premier of the Soviet Union. And it was also in 1956... Same year when Khrushchev said, we will bury you while addressing Western ambassadors at a reception at the, at the Polish embassy in Moscow in, on November 18th of 56. So how'd that work out for he, him? <laughs> he didn't, he didn't like the West so much. So here he is in England, visiting England and Soviet Western relations were not good. So on this visit to Britain, 
Britain wanted to take a look at this new Soviet ship. And some reports say to examine mine laying hatches or sonar equipment and other reports like from Peter Wright's book, Spy Catcher, Britain's naval intelligence wanted information on the potential new propeller system that this ship may have had. So MI6 sent a scuba diver down. Actually, two were reported as being sent down. One of them was this great diver, Lionel Crab. And Crab never <laughs> returned from this mission. And unfortunately, a headless, handless body was found 14 months later, dressed in scuba gear that he had worn on that date in April of 56. MI6 covered up the mission saying Crab was lost in some underwater exercise. And there were a lot of theories floating around, one being that Soviet sentries were stationed underwater to guard the ship, and they caught Crab, cut his air hose, and brought him aboard, and later he died. Other theories say he was shot underwater by a Soviet sniper. Okay, so you remember in Thunderball... Bond is sent to inspect the hull of the Disco Volante, the villain, Largo's <laughs> ship, his boat. And underwater, he's taking pictures underwater, remember, with the camera, the infrared camera. And he's discovered by Largo's frogmen as he was taking these pictures. And, of course, he sees the underwater hatch. Bond was a little more lucky than Crab. He escaped. But the photos showed an underwater hatch, which leads Bond to think that Largo's entire operation the theft of the plane carrying the nuclear missiles, etc., might be an underwater operation, including the plane that was hijacked. So, is there a connection between the crab event and these scenes in Thunderball? Wait, uh, wait, no, there, there obviously can't be, Dan. How could there be, right? <laughs> well, okay. The MI6 officer in charge of the Lionel Crab underwater deployment and that mission was Nicholas Elliott, a friend of Ian Fleming's. <laughs> That's a wrap. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining us today as we dove into The Silent Enemy from 1958. Please do us a favor and subscribe to our Cracking the Code of Spy Movie show through your favorite podcast app. Give us a five-star rating and tell all your friends about the show, too. This has been Dan Silvestri. And Tom Pizzato. Thanks for listening. Please join us for each episode on Cracking the Code of Spy Movies and leave us a voicemail through our website, spymovienavigator.com, with your feedback and suggestions for other podcasts.